for me, it's always going to be about making the industry kind of more fun to interact with. And making the, making the experience easier and more pleasurable for, for the client as well as for the, as well as for the artist. Episode 94. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week we've got a very exciting story as I sit down with Tom Grieford, who's the founder of Grieford Architects, and Joe Thompson, who is a software engineer. And we talk about how they have co-founded Brickworks. Now, Brickworks was born from a, a shared vision to provide architects with an easy-to-use software tool designed specifically to be able to meet those needs of the project team and to be able to help everyone who was collaborating uh, on the building design and construction of the project. And Tom actually met Joe when they were, I think they were introduced through friends at first, and then Tom was appointed by Joe actually to design his home extension. And through this relationship of working together, they were interested in how they could improve the running of an architectural project and how things could be better communicated and tracked and how the process could be much more client friendly and more sort of based on the user experience of the customer and Tom was very frustrated with the lack of specialist project management software available for small to medium sized architectural practices so they combined their um, expertise intelligence and passions uh, and created Brickworks so it was really good to be able to see sit down with both of them and for them to share their entrepreneurial story of the development and execution, implementation and product launch of Brickworks. So sit back, relax and enjoy Tom Grieford and Joe Thompson. So massive thank you to all of you for listening and supporting the Business of Architecture UK for the last couple of years. Big shout out to those of you who have come to our live events, attended the webinars, and of course to those of you who have downloaded the weekly podcast and have been listening to them on your bicycles. And as you know, we love helping architects win meaningful and profitable work, but it's not always that simple to implement these ideas or translate them into something that will work for you. So what I wanted to do was to to invite you onto a quick 15 minute chat with myself. We can both grab a cup of tea and I'd like to ask you about what content you found most valuable and why and what you'd like to hear more of. And I'd also love to hear more about your business, and what you're building at the moment and where you are headed to business wise in 2020. So there's no charge or any obligation with this call, just simply to find out how our content has been of value. And if we get that far and with your permission, of course, what might be next, what might be possible and how Business of Architecture UK could be supportive of that. Does that sound fair? Brilliant. So if you want to book a 15-minute chat with me, I'm calling these calls the BOA UK Discovery Call or just simply a chat with Ryan. Use the link in the information and I look forward to speaking to you. Tom, Joe, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. Absolute pleasure to have you here and you've invited me very kindly into your office uh, Tom, you are an architect, and Joe, you are a software engineer, and you've both come together and created a very interesting venture in Brickworks, and you also, Tom, run Tom Grieford Architects. Um, so tell me a little bit about, well, first of all, tell me a little bit about how you started your own practice, and how that has led, well, tell me about how you guys met, what was, what was the story there, and what is, what is Brickworks? So I started, just very briefly on my own practice, I started that in 2006, having been made redundant and kind of like many people of who I, you know, I was in my early 30s and um, actually late 20s and like many other young architects, I had a number of projects on the side that I was doing in my own time and I was made redundant and I thought, right, well, I might as well just have my own practice. It's much better than working for somebody else. Um, and so that was in 2006. Right. Cut forward many years. I mean, I think cut forward to 2012? No, a bit later. 11. 2011. Mm. Um, Joe was looking for an architect and through mutual friends. Um, so we have, a, we have some, some close mutual friends in common. Um, uh, was looking for an architect for his house extension and through mutual friend approached me and I came and 
designed your kitchen extension? Yes. Um, and I think, I mean, I was, we, we sort of stayed in touch after that yeah. a little bit. Yeah. Um, I think, in fact, we were in touch a couple of times because I um, have been involved in a number of slightly entrepreneurial uh, software right. projects. Um, I had been asked to look into the construction industry yeah. um, by a client of mine in software. They were, they had pointed out to me that construction is the third largest industry in the UK um, after financial services and retail. Um, and technology is absolutely prevalent through those first two mm. and almost completely absent in the third. And once I'd heard that, it kind of just became a little bit fascinating to me, this idea that actually there's a, there's a revolution due in, in the construction industry. And so I wasn't specifically interested in architecture, but you kind of slice it apart. And um, at the big end of things, um, so on big projects, uh, there's a lot of BIM, everything's digital. Uh, they use freestanding project management tools. You know, the, the, I don't say the technology is good, but the technology is present there. That's actually only half the industry. The other half of the industry is small projects, home improvement, that kind of thing. Mm. And there's so little technology there. And it's actually, once you start looking at it, it's really apparent that there's no technology there. Mm. Because, well, I mean, Tom, I think is a living example of this. You know, architects face all the pressures of, of running a business, of having client expectations and a lot of workflow stuff to deal with. Mm. Um, and, and there's just no tooling around to, to make that kind of manageable for people. Yeah. So, so, how, so how did it? How did the conversations begin? Was it was it something you were dealing with in your own practice, where where you were like, actually, this is a this needs a solution to it, or it would, it would it, yeah, very much so. I, mean, I think I'm always trying to do um, to run the practice more efficiently and improve the way we do things, improve the way we work, and improve the way we communicate with clients. And I was looking for um, a solution to simple, effective uh, communication of, of program with our clients because we were just doing it in Excel. Excel is very, and that's what most architects of our size still do. Um, and Excel is very clunky and it takes ages and I was never getting around to doing it and then you know, forgetting to send it on to the client and you know, sharing it with all the team and all that sort of stuff and every time you need to change it. It's, and so I was looking for something and I thought, this must be this. There must be a solution out there which is good for this, and there there just wasn't mm. absolutely wasn't anything that that met that for for the sort of projects that we're doing with the sort of budgets that we have, um, where we can't specifically where we can't afford project managers because often you know on, on our bigger projects there have been project managers and that's fine you know if you've got four or five million quid then you know spending some of that on a project manager is fine but if you're spending 100 grand or 200 grand then spending you know 20 or 30 grand of that on a project manager is not fine yeah and so we end up doing the work of the project manager so i yeah so i i'd actually originally spoken to uh, somebody else about it uh, before i came back to joe and they were just kind of quite dismissive about the whole thing and kind of quite unencouraging so i kind of went off and then joe and i started talking again about something i think it was to do with the um the, the other the what was the name of the other uh, startup you had you know with the final architect oh my, my amazing home yes amazing home my amazing home which was another startup that Joe was working with and Joe had asked me to contribute some work to that and and you know as is often the way with me it takes quite a long time to put two and two together but I eventually put two and two together and thought yeah that's the guy I need to speak to about this mm. and then we went and had coffee and and then it took us. You know, we, we then just kept on meeting and talking about it and meeting and talking about it and, and then um, does that develop a scope for what we thought this could be? And, and Joe, with his, you know, being very focused on, on keeping it simple, which, you know, I was, you know, it already starts before we'd even done anything about thinking about all the other millions of things we could do. 
but Joe quite rightly wanted to focus it on something which has, I think, proved really successful. Mm. And um, we then invested our own money in developing the initial app, uh, and Joe brought in some of his... Maybe you should talk more about this than, I, than, than me, given that it was me now talking yeah, about what and you I'm, did. And I'm, and I'm quite interested in, in that as well, the, the sort of the nature of your relationship and how did you manage to keep it simple? Because that's something that lots of early stage businesses, yeah. it's so easy to get lost in like this, this kind of sea of different ideas of where yeah. things could go. How, how did you manage to refine an idea? So I, as a, as a technology guy, and as a product guy, mm. I spend a lot of time fixating on the, the fidelity of a solution. You know, there, there are so many pieces of software that represent a really bad answer to a problem. Right. And what you see over and over again is um, me too bits of software that end up being incredibly successful because they just provide a better experience. They, mm. they're, they're not doing anything innovative. They're just doing a better job of it than, than everyone else has been doing for years. And I think... The, the kind of the real influence for me was about focusing on doing one thing well rather than a dozen things badly. Um, we actually we had a really fun episode uh, when we were in the sort of in the ideation phase of it, uh, where Tom invited a little group of his architect friends into the office one evening, um, and we got a case of cold beer and some crisps and whatnot. And just sat around, and we prepared some wireframes, you know, some really low fra lo fi sketches of, of what this product, this software might look like. Um, but we just kind of talked and asked some quite leading questions. And we, we did an activity where we wrote down kind of thematic um, features that it might have. So, you know, the, the ability to store documents or the ability to produce a project plan or the ability to engage your client um, in, in the process. Um, and then took turns for each person in the room to prioritize them. Mm. Um, now me being a proper dork, um, then kind of took that and attached a, a score to each position, each priority order people put them. And so we could then create a, a spreadsheet that kind of said, right, well, these are the highest scoring features that, you know, that our focus group say they would like to see. So that really kind of informed and we said, right, well, we're not going to do... 10 of these things, you know, and we chose, I think, three off the top of the list or something and said, okay, you know, how do we solve these problems? Mm. Um, and that was really it from there. You know, we then worked on some wireframes. We, um, so, so, so I engaged a, um, a software engineer, a friend of mine, to build a, um, a kind of early prototype of it. Um, just to kind of, you know, because you do, and this to Tom's point, you, you know, we put our own money in to get to, get to that. Yeah. And built a thing that, it was really interesting because it was not a great product, but there was kind of enough there that you could show it to people and they'd be like, oh, I get it. You, you yeah. know, they could see it. Yeah. Um, and, and so it's, you know, and, and things kind of snowball from there. So in fact, the, the first thing we did with, um, with, with our seed funding round was just rework the UX on that initial product and kind of take it past a kind of slightly clunky prototype into something that had some proper visual appeal that had a little bit of, um, I'd say a bit, a bit more, a bit more finesse in the way it presents its functionality. Um, and so, so that's kind of the, I'd say all the process up to mm. the point we had a, a product we were happy to take live. And so the, this initial sort of prototyping phase, you were, you were, kind of very clear your target market was to be architectural practice or any other kind of construction practice? No, I mean, it, so we, we've, we've focused so far on architectural practice, but I yeah. think it'll be anybody who's running small to medium-sized, you know, residential projects. I mean, and there, there will be loads of other applications, but we thought rather than trying to solve uh, a problem for the whole industry, um, we'll focus on that particular niche because that's a niche that we know well. Yeah. Um, and then we can take, then I imagine that we'll then be taking it to uh, architectural technologists, to structural engineers, anybody who's running jobs, 
can use the software. It's led by the consultant, by the lead consultant. Yeah. So they're the people who will... The, the, the idea is that um, whether it is an architect or a technologist or whoever it is, um, that it allows that person to communicate with his client effectively and simply and with the rest of the t team in the same way uh, and minimizing, you know, saving hours and hours of time. And that's the, the, it's, it's about saving time so that you can do, you as an architect can do or structural engineer or whatever it is you are, can go and do what you're good at, what you're trained for, what you got excited about when you went off to architecture school, which yeah. wasn't doing Gantt charts following, you know, working out how long the project's going to take. You know, that wasn't what got me out of bed or kept me up all night as a student. Um, doing architecture is that. And so I think, the, um, I, think, I think it does that really effectively. It is amazing that, as Joe said, it, when he started talking a while ago about the industry, that, it, it, that there's so little of this technology still in the construction space. And I think that is changing really, really rapidly. And we just mm -hmm. want to be part of that and, and be part of a, a new wave of, of tech firms of showing that, showing the construction industry that there is a lot of benefit to be had from whether, you know, whether you're an architect or a builder or whoever it is, there's a, a lot of benefit to be found in, in technology and in, in, in actually improving the way we work and communicate. And a lot of really shoddy things can be can be sidelined just with some simple technology mm -hmm. that I have to use very much. And which is the idea. How, how did how did your how did you define each other's roles in the collaboration? Because obviously, you've got um, one set of very specific school uh, skills in software and development and UX and that kind of domain. Mm. And you're an architect. You understand the industry. Yeah. How, what were the roles and how did they kind of cross fertilize each other? I think you just summarized it. I mean, yeah, I exactly mean, that. <laughs> um, I mean, we, we sort of had an agreement through the early phases yeah. that I would deal with the, the tech and product management side of things, and Tom would be the subject matter expert on what's needed mm. and provide a route to market mm. for what we eventually built. Um, and that's, that's created a kind of interesting dynamic because I think there was certainly a phase in the earlier parts of, of this journey where I think my workload was probably quite a lot higher than yours in a lot of this. You know, I was having to interact kind of daily with developers and balancing getting designs in from designers and all that kind of stuff. Um, as we've gone to market and um, built a business development function and... Um, started engaging with partners and done a fundraise and all that stuff. Um, I think that role has, that, that, that balance has moved quite a lot mm. um, in that I suddenly feel like I'm putting a lot more pressure on you to, um, well, so to, to, to lead the company really in, yeah. in that regard. Um, the technology side of things, I think we will scale again. You, you know, we, at the moment the product is quite small and, mm. um, and very focused, but yeah, I, you know, I think we've, we do have a lot of regard for each other's skill set and expertise. Um, and I think we're generally pretty good at not crossing any boundaries with that. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I think we balance each other quite nicely as well because my fixation on kind of every product I get involved with really is about customer experience. Right. And uh, some of the time, like the, the user experience work we've done on, on Brickworks, um, that's about making something that's kind of intuitive and looks nice and is easy to use. But there's this slightly bigger contextual piece around it, which is that the I think there's a massive customer experience problem in the domestic in the residential architecture industry. Um, and apart from you know the house you're doing the work to, quite often these building jobs are the biggest uh, bit of spending that people will ever undertake. You know, it's far more than they ever spend on a car or a holiday or anything like that. And yet the the customer experience around that is just awful. You know, people, I mean, I think it's actually really interesting. You don't have to go far to find people that will say, oh, we would have loved to have done a loft conversion or an extension or put a basement in or whatever it is, but we just couldn't be bothered. You, you know, it was too much aggro. We didn't want mm. to do it. And I think it's, 
you know, the, the whole process is notorious for being incredibly stressful and, and difficult. And that's assuming that you can lay your hands on the money you need to do it. Yeah. And then there's all these other kind of slightly professional paradoxes tied up in that, like getting someone to give you a good estimate of how much money you need to embark on this project um, typically involves embarking on the project. You know, you will typically spend a few thousand in fees before you're in a position to find out yeah. how many more tens or hundreds of thousands you need to have available. And, you know, that's a very difficult mindset for a consumer to be in. Mm. And so we're not, we're not tackling those challenges, or certainly we're not tackling those challenges in any kind of near time frame. But I, I've really tried to come at Brick, as, it, not just how we make architects' life a little bit easier, but how do we make an architect's client life um, mm. you know, a bit more fulfilling? How, how do yeah. they feel more engaged in the process? And how does that architect feel that they're providing a, a better quality service um, to, to, to their client through, through having a great tool? I think that's, that's really interesting what you've, a very astute observation about the sort of uh, pain of an architectural client where, you know, they often, for this feasibility stage, are, are kind of like, they just want to know what's possible, you know, before they invest anything. And it's, you can't, you have to kind of go through that process of putting some money up at risk before you can find out what the sort of the feasibility of a project is. And again, it's something that as architects, we kind of, you know, either struggle with that or we mm. kind of have to gently encourage the client to walk through those, walk through those steps with us. How, how have you found this process um, impacted, changed, influenced how you're practicing as an architect? I think the first thing I'll say is that it's made me a lot more um, open-minded about technology. So we've bought, we now use different uh, software uh, apps for parts of our, of our the running of the office that we never would. So we use Workflow Maps and Xero, for example, mm. two kind of classic ones, which I think I probably once upon a time might have been a bit cynical about whether they are actually beneficial, whereas they have transformed the way we've been able to manage the business. Um, and it certainly made me a lot more uh, yeah, a lot more open-minded to technology, whereas I think I probably was not a massive luddite, but something of a luddite, and um, and I can now re- I can now really see the huge benefit that, that you know we can offer through Brick, and then and and I'm much more open-minded about what other things that we could use to in 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 the space to help improve our lives. So going back to that core thing for me, which is allowing giving me more time to do what I'm actually really good at what yeah. I'm trained to do and that's why I think I, I think going back to the kind of uh, the, 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 the mutual talents that we have that's why I think we are a really good team because we are both quite focused on on the on the areas of the business that we really understand and we can keep that focus without it getting muddied so you know for me keeping the focus on on improving the, the loss of the architect so that he can do what he's good at, for Joe for improving um, the, 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 the simplicity, the functionality, and, and, and the, the user experience, whether it's the client or the architect. You know, those are quite different things. Mm. And the fact that we can both focus on them without kind of, you know, I, I wouldn't know a good UX if, if it came and kind of slapped me in the face and tickled me under the arms. And I think that's. Um, and, and I'm totally, I totally acknowledge that, and that, and so I completely respect Joe's understanding of what a good UX is or whatever else part mm. of, the, of the development is. So I think it's been really successful in that in that in that um, in that way actually. And so this initial prototyping phase that you took it through, and then you took it into the initial first round of seed seed funding, yeah, and. So what was what was that role like, and actually going about finding finance and raising capital to take it to the next to the next level? Is that something often as an architect we rarely rarely do unless we're never, doing? I've it. never done before. Yeah, exactly. Never. And 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 that was I mean that was a massive learning curve for me. All of that because it was um, yeah it was something I'd never done, never had to do, have done, and I don't think people do for. Architectural practices. So, if, if that's your, if as it was for me, the, the running an architectural practice is your 
first and only experience of running a business, then then suddenly having to find you know seed funding for a, a completely different sort of industry is is inherently going to be mm. quite a steep learning curve. Joe was obviously a lot more familiar with the process and and we essentially what we did was we went out and spoke to as many people as we could and as we knew and Joe kind of I mean I think you kind of almost told me what I was looking for. Yeah, I, I mean I think <clears throat> with the benefit of hindsight we I started on completely the wrong track with that. So so pretty much all of my external capital experience has been with um with funds, uh, um, venture capital funds right. of some sort or another. And I think I had sort of assumed that that was where we would go. Um, what I learned very quickly, being a very early stage startup, really with you know, kind of prototype and an idea, um, it's a very tricky industry to, um, to elbow your way into. And especially if you haven't got any market traction, um, and it's been very interesting for me because actually having worked with quite a few companies that have got uh, venture capital investors, there's always a bit of otherness in that relationship um, such that the, the management of the business, I'd say, very rarely feels like their venture capital investors are on the same side as them. Mm. You know, it's quite an adversarial relationship and and the, the VCs will normally be looking for... Um, what investment horizon they've got available. You know, because typically VCs are not investing their own money. They're yeah. investing somebody else's money and they're due to return that fund by a certain date. So they will invest in your business, but they need to be able to get out of your business again yeah. in four years or five years' time to show a return to uh, you know, their, their upstream investors. And some of those influences are quite unhelpful in trying to run a business. Mm. Also, I think Tom and I are perhaps individually less so, but certainly together, some of the least structured uh, people I've ever come across. Um, you know, we we did begin with a business plan, but it was not terribly, um, yeah, it was not very structural or, or prescriptive about what we planned to do. It's much more about having a vision for how the world should be. Um, and so I think, yeah, you know, I was... I felt like I learned quite a lot in that early phase, mm. talking to a few funds that either didn't get it or I just felt like there was sort of a credibility gap between where we were and what they were looking for. Yeah. Which I think with, with the benefit of hindsight was perhaps a lack of imagination on their part mm. that actually this is a perfectly viable way to start a venture anyway. It just perhaps doesn't tick you know, the boxes they get. Mm. Um, and I get it because you know VC firms screen you know a hundred applications a month or something like that and and I think there is a kind of you know there's there's an inflationary aspect to the bullshit that goes into those things you know if you're not showing a growth trajectory that gets you through you know 100 million users by month six and whatever um it's almost like you're talking the wrong language mm. and there's nothing about brick that is you know kind of looking at the spectacular transformation what we're trying to do, as Tom said, you know, is be part of this, um, you know, is part of the construction industry and the architecture industry, just embracing the 21st century a little bit more with, with some good quality tools. Yeah, embracing it a lot. And, and so what was, what was the nature of the, the seed investment that you, you gained? Was it through private joint venture partners or...? Yeah, basically. So we, we spoke to lots of people that we knew and, um, and eventually came to... A, to a, a group of people who were interested and and then they helped us um, they then helped us uh, structure the business plan you know and they and 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 uh, arrive at an agreement that 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 was that gave us the capital we needed for yeah. for 18 actually almost probably it's going to be pretty much two years worth of yeah, yeah 18, to 18 months to two years worth of, of, of the runway. So that, and we're about kind of halfway through that at the moment. It, it, it's, it's really interesting how you were saying actually that uh, venture capital investment can really be a little bit sort of adversarial or dictatorial in a way mm. where there's kind of guiding, you know, it's not necessarily entrepreneurially led in that aspect. And it can be, there's a lot of, lot of other stakeholders to be answering to. 
So what for you were you looking for beyond just capital? Were you looking for from your investors? Well, I think we were looking for people who had experience in in um, backing tech startups, but who were also you know recognised this was quite a recognised that this was quite a unique venture that this was going into a field that hadn't really been massively tested. Yeah. Um, and who was supportive and essentially relaxed about that, I think. Mm. You know, and, and that we've certainly... Well, what, what's really striking for me, you know, against, I'd say, pretty much every other venture I've been involved in, um, is, you know, our board meetings now are incredibly collaborative. Yeah. You know, and our, our, our investors, they, they hold us to account on things. Mm. You know, they're very clear about their expectations for, of us. But actually, it really feels like they've crossed the water to us on a lot of things yeah. um, you know they're so supportive of the business and they are incredibly helpful about providing advice um, and I think helping us to let's say look at things you know in the, in the right way mm -hmm. um, it's and I think that you know it's exactly what we need for a business like this that is really based on a kind of let's say a vision rather than you know executing a particular plan uh, through a series of you know hoops to jump through and, that, and I think, as an architect, I always say to my clients that the best projects are, are, are always the ones which are team effort, yeah. collaborative, you know. And you want the architect, the client, the contractor, and everybody else to be, everybody's working towards the same thing, which is a successful project. And I feel in, in, in many ways this has been very much the same with our investors. They are, as Joe said, very supportive and... And they and we collaborate where we need their input. You know, they are they are generous with their, with their time when we need that time mm. um, because it, you know, they, as I said, they recognise that this is a, a space that hasn't really been explored yet. So it is you know we you know we are feeling our way into a market that 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 still uses very very manual analog, not literally analog. But you know, actually, sometimes actually we. <laughs> it's an old actually, no, no, Well, no, actually, you know, I was presented the other day by with a um a program <laughs> with an abacus. No, but I was presented with a program by a contractor the other day, which he had drawn out on graph paper, and you know that that's still happening. Yeah. You know, we're still getting we're still getting tenders back, which uh, which are um you know someone has printed out our Excel spreadsheet and then written the figures in by hand. Or, mm. Yeah. So, you know, that is still the industry that we work in. You know, the majority of contractors that I work with that build the houses that we design are still very, very analogue. Yeah. And, you know, they might have got to Excel, but they definitely haven't yet got into brick and so and and into the 21st century. So they're kind of hovering in the mid-90s, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, but what, what I think is so interesting is that on the consumer end of things... Um, you know, we've got, there's a whole industry of media around what beautiful houses look like. Yeah. And, you know, you can buy a copy of a nice magazine for, what, seven, eight quid now? That is just wall-to-wall -wall pictures of of smart houses and, you know, fantastic architecture and great interior design. Um, but the the kind of subtext to all of it is this stuff builds itself. You know, there's... Um, and then you get programs like Grand Designs that's essentially what... I can't remember how many seasons they've made of it now, but yeah, well, it's it's a long running program about what an absolute nightmare it is building a house. Basically, <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's the long and the short of it. Yeah. Um, but they, and they, but they um, don't even sometimes. They, I mean, we you know we've had a classic example of if, you know mag, you know those sorts of publications don't always make it easier because they're trying to still trying to sell. So we've had you know houses published where they've where the, the publications concerned have have. Uh, Put the, the the bill cost in at half where it actually is, yeah. And you know we see that on television as well. So people, you know, there was one house that that was was it was less than fifty percent of what the clients had actually paid for. It was published, and we got so many inquiries about it, and every one, none of them materialised into everything because everybody was sold the dream of building a house like this for yeah. that yeah. much, and and that's not reality. So I think everybody's complicit in in mis-selling mm. the dream yeah were. well you know but it goes through to things like 
I mean, Howls.com is a good example, and or even you know Pinterest and Instagram now. You know, there's so much of this stuff about the the dream of it, mm. and I said, you know, the as a as a consumer, the experience kind of goes off the edge of a cliff as soon as you actually have to start doing it. Mm. Um, and so, which is not surprising when you've got contractors preparing programs on graph paper and um, some very old fashioned ways of working. And I think, you know, if we'd walked into the market and said, right, we're going to build something that makes it easy to put a, you know, a new kitchen on your house or something, you know, to put two floors on the top uh, uh, if you're loft, you know, it would be, um, that's an enormous undertaking. That involves transforming whole sections of the industry at a time. I think what we're looking to do is just find one really tricky pain point. And the lovely thing about architecture is that it's right in the middle of everything. You know, typically that project management role does fall to the architect rather than, yeah. you know, the contractor or the surveyor or the quantity surveyor or, you know, any of those things. And so it's, it's a really fun place to start with how you can start moving people's expectation yeah. of what these projects looks like. And, and it's all about communication and it's all, it's communication, communication, communication. It's just... It's, you know, if, if things are communicated easily and clearly, then even if they're problems, then they are, they, they can be resolved. It's, mm. you know, where almost all the pro projects we have where there are problems is through lack of communication and unwillingness to communicate or just a lack of clarity about what is happening from, especially from a client's point of view, because the client, because of the nature of these projects, the clients are often only doing one project in a lifetime or one every 20 years. And so they won't be doing this all the time. So, you know, they don't know what the RBA stages mean and what happens in each RBA stage, for example. Um, so if you can communicate that easily and effectively, then, then you've, got, you've got the core of a successful project. And that's what Brick is about there. It's about being the backbone core of the project and there are millions of other things that have to happen around it but if we can start off by communicating what happens in the project and how long it's going to take and who does what really effectively in a way that is easy for everybody to understand and and which can be updated and easily then that's just that's mm. the basis for a happy project mm. yeah so it just you say that reminded me about 50 million years ago um I was required to become Prince 2 certified. And so I did that awful thing where you have to go and spend three days being trained in structured project management. Um, and I remember almost none of it, I would say. But the one thing that sticks in my mind was the trainer saying, um, you will never get a client that complains about getting too many updates. Mm. And I think... All the rest of my Prince 2 training has left me and that bit has stayed with me that actually this point about communication, you know, I think the assumption when you're running a project is that if the status of things hasn't changed materially, you don't need to tell people what's happened. Um, the reality is that I think people want to know what's going on mm. when they think about it. It doesn't matter what the status of those things is. It's yeah. just as long as it's on their mind, they want to know what's going on. And if, you, and if, if there's a delay, for example, the classic one is you know, a delay in planning and the knock-on effect. If you have a, a, a if so, if you use us as an example. So say, you know, you submit your planning application, you tell your client that's okay, you know, in eight weeks time, we'll get our planning permission. And then actually, the, and then we'll be able to be, you know, we'll be on site in July, whatever it is. And then it actually takes, you know, 16 weeks, 20 weeks to get your planning permission. And and your client is, nobody's, nobody's told your client, nobody's told them that that still, I mean, that means that they're then definitely not going to be on site in July. But if that can be quickly and easily, and if they have a timeline so that they say, well, actually, we can't get on to the next stage until that has happened. So obviously it's going to, you know, and then you can, if those things, if they, clients are, are much happier to receive news, which isn't overwhelmingly positive, if they receive that news. It's when you get to late June and they say, right, so we're starting on site next week, aren't we? And you're like, well, no, we're not, you know. Yeah. You know, and it's it, 16, 20 weeks. And, 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 and you know, if, if that, that's where the problem occurs. It's not, the, it's not the actuality of the delay. It's because it hasn't been communicated. And that goes for pretty much everything else. Mm. I think most people are reasonable and everybody knows that things don't always go according to plan. What people don't like, and, and that includes us in, in our 
various careers is is not knowing that that thing hasn't gone to plan or that that thing has changed. That's, yeah. That's the, that's the and, and exactly like you said, the knock-on effect of that yeah, and what, exactly. what that's going to be. And it seems so uh, small in a way. Or sometimes from an architect's perspective, you kind of just think, well, they should know. Or the client, we make assumptions about what we think yeah. other people should know. Therefore, don't get into communication yeah. and then wonder why the client is upset or yeah. why they're getting getting pissed off. Um, it's interesting that you've you've talked a lot about the vision or that the, the one of the sort of important aspects of this of this of Brickworks was the, is the vision. Could you expand a little bit more on on what the vision is for you in terms of like the impact on the industry? Because we're starting to get a, a feel for it here in terms of like really solidifying good communication and just bringing that kind of client experience like you're kind of looking at a root cause a root way of improving client experience for the residential um what's the sort of overarching vision or how 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 have you worked worked on it with each other so i think going back to what i was saying earlier that i think we do come from slightly different points on the compass with yeah this um, you know, I, I don't think we'll get to a point that we have automated the the delivery of, a, of an architecture project. That's mm. not really what we're going for. I think creating something that architects are happy to use, that their clients are, are happy that it's being used, uh, to then bring other consultants, to bring the contractor and the construction program into that, I think mm. would be amazing for for brickworks that's i think that, that that would be a kind of relatively short to medium term goal for me the big picture thing is all the rest of that consumer experience stuff um which is i mean i don't know what kind of where that starts and ends particularly um you know to the point that it's substantially easier to find a house to buy now uh, sat on the sofa on your mobile phone than it is to get any work done to that house sat on the sofa on your mobile phone. Um, you can identify the houses, you can arrange to go and see them, you can arrange the mortgage with which you're going to buy them, you can um, sort out you know, all the insurance, the removers, you, you know, every part of that process can be done. You can also you know, order dinner, find your future spouse. Kind of, there's all this stuff that we just expect to happen in a digital context now. And, and yet the, there are these huge projects. And like I said, just by industry value, you know, tens of billions of pounds going through this industry that, that never touch kind of any kind of digital tool from a, con mm. from a consumer's perspective. So that's really interesting. Now, whether that means we get into, um, I don't know, you know, helping people find the the finance to, um, to 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 realize their projects or get into interior design you know i don't think we've got very clear views about any of that stuff i think you know all of that can be quite far out for me it's always going to be about making the industry kind of more fun to interact with yeah yeah and making the making the experience easier and more pleasurable for for the client as well as for the as well as for the architect. The nice thing about Brick, and, the, and this is why we, we think that Brick has got a, a kind of great huge potential, is because it's based on program, the timeline, everything else can hang off that. Mm. And that's the one thing that is consistent and important throughout the project. So from the moment, so at the moment it just starts at architect's, appoint, uh, architect's appoint, appointment and it goes through to completion. But, you know, maybe it actually extends from the moment you're, you know, maybe you as a consumer uh, download brick uh, at the moment you think right I desperately need to do a kitchen extension or I'll, I want to build a new house and I, you know and that's what that's the moment that you actually download it and and start using it and then that you know and it it can lead you through that that road less traveled because it is a road less traveled for most most people mm. um, and that's where it gets exciting so you know there's a there's a huge potential as Joe says from a consumer point of view as well as from an architect's point of view which makes it a really potentially sweet place to be in where we can be really enhancing the life of architects by giving them a tool which is easy to use, which is uh, which is enjoyable to use, which which 
reduces their stress, their workload, and helps them communicate. And we can also, uh, you know, make the client's journey easier and more, you know, and more enjoyable as well. Mm. So that is would be a lovely thing to be able to introduce into the industry and and make that the norm rather than the kind of horror that, that <laughs> many people experience. And you know, I'm, I, you know, projects go wrong, and and almost all the time. They could that those things could be avoided. Yeah, and sometimes it's because um, that people are being badly advised. Sometimes it's because people aren't taking the advice that they the, the good advice that they're being received that they're, they're they're being offered. But whatever it is, it's it, it tends to be in the realm of communication that, that things go wrong. And if there's a standard which is a best practice which which helps the architect and the consumer, then if we can raise the bar of that best practice, then mm. that's a, a reasonably good place to be. And I think what, what's been really nice, to, to Tom's point there, um, we've had some quite detailed conversations with the RIBA about this, mm. kind of all the way through the process. And, you know, we've, we've embedded the, the plan of work um, in... Uh, it's It's been our default kind of operating model uh, mm. in, in Brickworks from day one it's been really nice to see how supportive they are of that because mm-hmm. I think that there's a real recognition from their side that actually a lot of this best practice does not permeate through um, every project. Yeah. And then a thing that can drive that adoption is is going to be, going to receive support from them, uh, whatever. So, you know, it's, yeah, it, it's quite nice to see there's a recognition that actually a bit more standardization in, in how we do things uh, is, is beneficial. Why do you think... And it's interesting, I mean, architects uh, in one sense have always had like a romance with technology and, uh, you know, kind of love to speculate about what architecture could be and how technology could be infused, particularly in the making of buildings, mm. but less so in the, the kind of softer skills that are involved in the design process. And what, why, do you th- why do you think that the construction industry has been slow to adopt technology in facilitating these types of business processes or communication processes? Maybe because it's a very manual analog industry. I mean, ultimately you are, it is an industry, unlike say financial services, it is an industry where you are actually going out and making things and you need, and it, and the end result is a physical thing that has mm. to be physically made. And maybe that just kind of yeah. permutates Back to the, back to the people who. Are, yeah, who that, are that's, that's that. interesting though. You see, I, I would come at that from exactly the opposite end of, of the scale. Um, I don't think construction has been slow to adopt technology. Right. You know, actually, good CAD packages started being available in what the late seventies, mid eighties, something like that. So, yeah, I, I really disagree that it's that the construction industry is slow to adopt technology. Um, and I think, you know, if you look back, things like, um, you know, CAD, good accessible CAD systems started being available in the late 70s, early 80s. And actually, they were adopted incredibly quickly. And, and I think that transformation from uh, drafting by hand to computers, you know, there was nothing especially kind of laggard about that. It, you know, about 15 years. Okay, but I think you could say the same about retail. There, there are an awful lot of high street stores that didn't have online shopping for a very long time, mm. for instance. You know, I don't, think, I don't think there's any evidence to say that the construction industry or the architecture industry has resisted technology. I think I'd go the other way and say that um, I think the technology industry has done a very bad job of serving mm. the, yeah, the construction industry. Um, there have not been the products. Mm. You know, CAD came in. Um, not specifically for architecture, but for any kind of design work. But actually, there have not been very, really very many technology companies at all that have focused on that industry. Um, and I think it's, I don't say it's a lack of imagination, but you know, when, when you say, oh, but it's an industry that's about screwing things together and putting buildings up, and it's a very you know, hands-on industry, that's why there's no technology. I wonder if that was not the assumption of all the companies that were busy making tools for every other industry mm. as well. And perhaps if 
if people, you know, if, if there had been a greater involvement of, of other groups, you know, things like technologists in the construction industry earlier on, mm. we might have seen some of those products coming out yeah, of it sooner. I, I buy that. I do buy that, actually. And I think, um, I, certainly I find it very frustrating when I see really things done really badly which could be done really well because we know, know that there's the software to do it. Mm. It's just like when you, when you do still see planning applications which, where people have submitted really bad drawings and you just think, you know, dude, there's really great software to, to do that for you now. You don't have to actually, you know, draw everything really, really badly. Yeah. Um, but certainly, you know, when, when now when, when contractors put together a, a program for us and they put together that, that program, as I said, on graph paper, it's, it, you know, it's incredibly frustrating because you know actually it's going to be very hard to get, more so I think it's going to be hard to get the contractors on board than it is to get the architect, architectural industry on board. I think if I, if I said to a lot of our contractors, I now want you to use brick as the means of communicating with your, your program, most of them would just throw up their hands in despair because I think contractors are fundamentally quite... You know, most of them are Luddites. And um, that doesn't mean that they aren't fantastic at what they do. Yeah. And that's there's, so there's an interesting challenge there. So and that kind of leads on then as well. How, how has the kind of marketing aspect of Brickworks been evolved and developed? Because this is one of the sort of the key points of any, any new startup is the, the language, how you're languaging the problem that you're solving mm. to your clients. And it's quite, it's just, I find it really refreshing to hear, uh, you mm. know, when you're talking about things like just client communication and actually how so many of our relationship breakdowns in architecture happen as a result of just not keeping client expectations and communication clear and open. Mm -hmm. how, how do you communicate that message as as the, as the sort of marketing, how are you working that in the marketing of, of Brickworks? I don't really feel like we're quite there mm. to talk authoritatively about what, what message we take to architects. I think we're very much in the phase now where we're discovering what messages resonate with people. Mm. Um, and we've talked quite a lot about the the inception of the product and how we've arrived at a set of features that we think hangs together as, as something viable um, as a proposition. How we, how we articulate that and get people interested in it is still something that is a bit of a work in progress. Mm. Um, the, the corollary to that is that it's a really niche product. By, you know, by any measure, it's pretty niche. And that I think that really helps us. You know, we've worked it out. I think in in our home market, um, and you know, we we do look at international, and I think that's somewhere that um, that's that, that's an avenue we'll be pursuing fairly shortly. But in the UK, I think we you know there's like three and a half thousand practices that have the right sort of profile for mm. for what we're doing. You know, now that's that's a really manageable number of of organisations to get a message to. Mm. Um, and so I think we're, well, we're getting a lot of excellent help from people on how to, how to communicate. Um, but yeah, I, you know, I, th I think that's almost one of the big experiments we're undertaking here. Tom, I mean, what's, I'm interested because obviously you're the one that's the architect and you're the one where all your friends are architects too. Yeah. No, I, I only know people who are architects. Yeah, it, it's, it's been very interesting to have the conversations. As Joe said, we started out, one of the earliest exercises that we did was a group of my friends who are architects who, who came together. And, and, and so obviously I've got kind of an immediate network of people that we can be reaching out to and we yeah. are slowly reaching out to them. And that has its benefits and its drawbacks. The benefits are that often people will be... Um, give us really frank and clear feedback, which is really what we need um, to make the product work. The drawbacks are that the, the people who, are, who don't want to give us frank and clear feedback are often reluctant to give us, you know, negative feedback if they don't want to. Um, so, you know, I do always encourage people to say, yeah, I, you know, one of the great things about an architectural training, as you know, is that you get a very thick skin 
And so, you know, and um, there's nothing like sitting with a client who do really doesn't like what you've designed to, to kind of, you know, make you, uh, yeah, grow a very, very thick skin. So I'm, I'm very clear with everybody we speak to. I don't really care whether they like it or not. I want to know why they like it or not yeah. um, so that we can further improve the product because as we keep on saying, there isn't anything that does this. There isn't anything that helps that do solve this problem. And I think it is a real problem. I don't think any, I don't think anybody disputes that the, the problem doesn't exist, that there isn't you know, a tool out there which really helps communicate uh, a, a domestic project or any sort of project, really. So uh, it's, it's really about, uh, yeah, as Joe said, understanding the messaging, messaging so we get the messaging right. And um, and trying to get you know speak to as many people, but that that market isn't enormous, so we we will be able to get to everybody. And whether they ignore us and keep on using Excel or you know or not, you know some. But the majority of people we are speaking to are just using Excel still, and and, you, and making that step change is, is the biggest thing. Convincing people to 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 stop using Excel, to start using Brick, and the first couple of times they set it up, um, you know, using Brickworks and and. They they they'll find it much so much easier um, than having to start again with a blank Excel document, mm. and so it, I think it's making that. Well, and that's been one of the really interesting bits of learning I think we've got already is I think conventional wisdom with software tells you that if you can get people to hear your message, you, you know your initial contact, then that's a great qualifier for the rest of the sales journey you need to go on to sell your product to them what we found i think because it's it's very um it's a very specific solution in the industry and it's more or less unique i would say mm. um people are really happy to talk to us people are really interested to hear about it and actually our our sales kind of hill to climb comes a little bit further down the process where they're all enthused and they're into it and then you're like well, come on, use yeah. it. Tell us what you think, you know. And getting them to take that step and actually start setting up a project or, you know, to play around with it, that's where we see the, um, the, the difficulty maintaining the engagement. And that's really useful for us because, you know, when we're building a business around this, we, we need to have some really um, very sharp tools to, to, um, to control the, the, the movement in, in that part of the sales process. So we've we've really been sort of refining mm. that part of it, but it's you know it's really interesting because this this whole exercise is about learning a how do we build a product that meets the needs of this industry, um, but I'd say probably more importantly than that, how do we build a a business development a sales machine that can can get a message into those organisations and I think architecture practices especially small architecture practices. Um, there's not a playbook for how to sell to them because by and large, they, they've not bought a lot of technology before. So, you know, that, that's one of our kind of startup hypotheses is that we need to find messaging and find a sales process that people respond to. You know, and it's not about high pressure or, you know, offering incredible discounts or something like that. It's just about finding, uh, you know, understanding the, the mentality of the people we're talking to and, and figuring out, uh, you know how to work alongside that to to become part of their their working pattern. Brilliant. What's next? Ah. What are the next steps in the next few months? Well, well the next steps. I think we want we we need twenty twenty. Um, what needs to happen in twenty twenty is for us to really prove this hypothesis that we've developed and prove that there is a market that people really do want to use this tool and and understand that there are better, more efficient ways of working than the kind of classic Excel spreadsheet or graph, graph paper. And then we've got to their kind of two directions, um, which I think we will probably take in parallel. So if we can get through that and then get on to our, on to our next round of funding, mm. we'd really like to A, take it into other markets, because as far as we can see, there aren't, uh, the, 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 this problem exists everywhere. Wherever you have an architectural market, you have the same problem. So, uh, and the, the way the product has been developed and built means it actually should really easily translate into other markets and we shouldn't, it won't need to be completely re, re, redeveloped every time we go to another market. And then the other thing is, is, you know, 
what are other services we can be offering alongside the core service. And we've got a host of ideas on those and, and, that, and, and, and exploring those and talking about those with our existing users, which is what we're doing at the moment. Um, looking at which of those might be, uh, you know, might make the product even more attractive, and and maybe you know there there maybe we're missing uh, one or two things that will actually push the majority of people from Excel into using yeah. Brickworks. Yeah, you know those are those those are the sorts of things that we're looking at um, yeah. for next year's. Uh, that, that's it. You know, I don't think we will be. I don't think there's any ambition for Brick to become this or Brickworks to to become this huge product that kind of manages you know the whole life cycle of everyone's um, involvement in in uh, residential architecture i think we've still got quite a way to go to make um let's say to, to realize the potential of disrupting that particular piece of the puzzle um i think i'd really like to see us have a a stable of of different apps that meet different needs, different points along the journey that play to different audiences. Mm. Um, I could really see us building tools for um, for contractors, for instance, um, for for clients uh, at some point. If, you know, I think that there's all sorts of places that we, we could go. Um, yeah, so I, I, it's not necessarily about some big cohesive product. I think you know, there's a whole load of point solutions. Yeah. And in an industry where hopefully in a few years' time, there will be a hundred great, very targeted, very fit-for-purpose uh, software products available, we, want, we might have, you know, a handful or a couple of handfuls of those in the market. And I think that would be a great place for us to, mm. to be. Brilliant. Guys, thank you so much for sharing your story with me today. It's been absolutely fascinating. Our pleasure. Well, my pleasure anyway. Thank you, Ryan. Nice to meet you. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for listening. And don't forget to book your 15-minute chat with me by using the link in the information. I look forward to speaking with you. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.